Hello, my name is Matt Kelso. I'm the manager of data and technology at the Fact Tracker Alliance. And today I wanted to introduce a tutorial video series for you. Uh, we're going to be looking at affected population analysis using U.S. Census Blocks. And it's a complicated process, uh, but we think it's worth the effort. And I'm going to walk you through the steps of how we do this type of analysis. Before we get into it, we have some things to talk about as far as the reason this type of analysis is important. So let's start to get into it. If you aren't familiar with us, this is FrackTracker's mission statement. FrackTracker Alliance maps, analyzes, and communicates the risks of oil, gas, and petrochemical development to advance just energy alternatives that protect public health, natural resources, and the climate. This type of analysis has the capacity to take a deeper look into who is being affected by a variety of things. Um, and this concept often will touch on the concept of environmental justice. The United States Environmental Protection Agency defines environmental justice as follows. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, natural, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. This goal will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental health and hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. That's the uh, US EPA's definition. Um, states have some ability to implement these in different ways. Pennsylvania takes the sort of basic approach which is sort of the minimal approach of, of what can define environmental justice agencies as looking at the combination of two different factors, which is 20% at or below federal poverty line and or 30% or more identifies as non-white minority. And these are within census tracts. Um, and census tracts are areas where um, census data is aggregated to make this determination. So we'll get a little bit more into census tracts in the near future. What we're looking at here is the EPA EJ screen. And this is a wonderful tool for starting to understand some of the characteristics of areas that are affected by industry. Let's take a look at some of the available data here. We're gonna click on environmental justice ind indexes and try one of these. We'll use uh, 2017 diesel particulate matter and you can see it fills in the data and you can see some of these polygons are really quite large and some of them are quite small um, this is similar to what we just saw in the in the previous um, slide with census tracts in Pennsylvania because these are in fact census tracts if you click on one of these polygons you can see it has a FIPS number here, and the number of digits here is indicative of what scale this is. And so these are census tracts. This one has a population of 2,482 people in this, in this geography. And let's look at this one here, for example, 1,330. We'll get out of Allegheny County and look at some of the more rural ones. This one has 1,391 people. Over here in Ohio, 557 people. And this, this tract here has nearly 4,000 people. And there's nothing wrong with using census tracts as your basis for analysis, but it is not going to be as precise as using something that is smaller. So this data is from 2010, the 2010 census. This is on their website, uh, and it summarizes Pennsylvania, which is the state we're going to be using for our example uh, uh, analysis. And you can see for this 2010 census, Pennsylvania has 3,218 census tracts, 9,740 block groups, so three times as many, and 421,545 blocks. So that's really quite a few more blocks, which means it's quite a bit more precision than using tracks or block groups. And so that's why we uh, try to estimate population using blocks when possible. 
The numbers for the 2020 census will be similar to this, although slightly different. As a point of comparison, if you wanted to do an analysis based on zip codes, um, it's, a, it's worth noting that zip codes are a little more difficult to work with because they don't line up nicely with, uh, with county borders. But um, you can see here that there are 1,789 zip code tabulation areas in Pennsylvania. So roughly half the number of census tracts. So it would be less precise than using census tracts. So just for a visual demonstration of the differences here, we're going to look at tracks, block groups, and blocks for one particular county. We're going to look at uh, Butler County, which is north of the Pittsburgh area. So currently we're looking at uh, census tracts in, in Butler County. You can see that there's a handful of them. Now let's move on to block groups. And you can see that there's significantly more. Some of these townships here have been cut into two pieces. And when we move on to blocks, there's really quite a few more. So you get so much more precision by looking at blocks than you do at these other intervals. I want to demonstrate why I think this, this is important. Um, we've zoomed in here to the town of Butler. And what we're looking at here in red are building footprints. Now, of course, these don't align one-to-one -one with houses. Um, you can see that there's plenty of large facilities that are likely industrial or commercial in nature. But you can also see that the placement of these um, structures is not uniform throughout even these uh, areas that we're looking at. And these are, of course, the census blocks. So if we go and look at the census tracts, Sorry for the red on pink display here, but you can see in some cases uh, you could have an area of interest that would have a very different representation from what might actually be the case. And if we change it back to blocks, you have the chance for significantly more precision in capturing the right number of people who live in these houses for your analysis. So to bring some of these points home, uh, we like using census blocks. Uh, we think that the methodology is more accurate, has less potential for error than using census tracts or census block groups. It is important to note that the process should still be considered a model, and the results, therefore, should still be considered estimates. Um, and it's also worth noting that the methodology assumes an even distribution across the geography, which, as we've seen, is actually not the case. Um, but that is a weakness in this model. And we're also interested in getting feedback from viewers of this tutorial. Um, when you look through the process, uh, we're interested to see whether anyone has ideas on how this methodology can be improved upon. Uh, we'd like to be a part of that conversation. Uh, are there any significant gaps that it is not accounting for um, that could be addressed in other ways? Um, does the process misrepresent or distort facts on the ground? You know, is it is it culturally sensitive? Um, things like that. These are these are things that we'd like to hear feedback from. If you uh, watch this whole tutorial. Hi, I'm Matt Kelso. I'm the manager of data and technology for the Frack Tracker Alliance, and today we're going to talk about the process to estimate populations that are affected by a number of different facilities, and we're going to be using census block data. Uh, to do that, and so let's talk about this uh, this process. So the example we're going to use today is based in Pennsylvania, and there's a study that recently came out that says unconventional oil and gas development exposure and risk of childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and in this study, they looked at children age two through seven in a two kilometer area around unconventional oil and gas drilling. And they found that the people in this age bracket uh, had a 1.98 or almost two times the odds of developing acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And so we're going to look at the people who are in this, uh, in this area in Pennsylvania within two kilometers of drilled unconventional oil and gas wells. 
In order to perform this analysis, we need two pieces of data. One is the unconventional oil and gas wells, and then the other one is the census data. The census data is actually broken up into two different parts, which we'll get to shortly. Let's talk about the unconventional oil and gas wells first. So uh, typically, I used to get the data from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection Open Data Portal. So you'd go here and go to the oil and gas section and then the second one down is oil and gas unconventional well locations, which is what we'd want. Unfortunately, they've removed the opportunity to download this data. You can open it online and view it that way, um, but they've removed the option to download this data and we really need to have this um, downloaded in order to perform this analysis. So instead, I'm gonna go to the Pennsylvania Spatial Data Gateway Access, or POSDA, which is a website run by Penn State University, and a DEP directly imports their data here. Now this data includes oil and gas locations, conventional and unconventional, in the United States. And I've already downloaded that, so let's take a look at that real quick. These are all of the wells in Pennsylvania that DEP has data for. If we look at the attribute table, we can see that there's more than 217,000 of them. We don't need all of these wells though, so we're going to go to uh, select the wells that we do want. And we're gonna select by attribute, and we're gonna do a new selection, and we're gonna have a new expression here. There are gonna be a couple parts to this. We're gonna start with just the unconventional wells because that's all that we're looking for in this study. And so we scroll down to unconventional. Unfortunately, they're not alphabetical. So unconventional is equal to yes. We're going to add a clause. We want only the ones that have been drilled. So we want one where the spud date is not null. And there are a couple of unusual entries here. So let's take a look at this. Let's execute this tool and, and you can see what I mean. It's always worthwhile to look at your data to make sure that it makes sense. So if we look at the selected records, you can see we're down to 13,726 records now. Um, we're gonna look at this column of spud date. And you notice that there's a number of wells here with this 1-1-1800 spud date. And this is something that DEP just uses as a dummy date in their system. So it doesn't mean null. We've got rid of the, the wells that had no spud date, uh, the ones that hadn't been drilled. Um, but it means that they don't know when uh, the spud date was. They're, they don't have that data in their system. But you'll notice that there's these two wells here right at the beginning that say operator reported not drilled. So these are wells that were proposed and they didn't happen for one reason or another. In some cases, I can tell you uh, there are other well pads, there are other wells on the same well pad, and so the calculation wouldn't be that far off. But to be uh, as exact as we can, we're going to get rid of these wells that have not been drilled. So we're going to add a clause here and we're going to go to well status and includes the values and now we get a drop down list that we can choose from. So we want anything that has been drilled. It can be plugged, that's fine, but we want anything that has been drilled. So abandoned, active, this is if you mouse over DEP abandoned list means that it needs to get plugged. DEP orphan list, that means they don't know who the operator is and it needs to get plugged. DEP plugged, that means that DEP plugged them. Operator reported not drilled. This is one of the ones that we're trying to get rid of. So we're gonna leave that unchecked. Plugged oil and gas well. Plugged unverified. So that means that we're not sure that they've been plugged properly or not because Nobody's checked. Proposed awaiting 
uh, authorization decision. We're going to not include this one because it hasn't been drilled yet. Proposed but never materialized. And we're going to omit this one as well. And regulatory inactive status, which means that it is a drilled well, but it's not currently producing. So we have 13,726 wells. We're going to run this filter. And it just removed two wells. So this is the subset that we're looking for. These are drilled wells in Pennsylvania that are considered unconventional. And we've gotten rid of the ones with a status that was a conflict with the spud date. Now that we have the subset of wells that we're looking for, I'm going to go ahead and export it to a new layer. So I'm just going to go down to data and export features. And unconventional DW drilled wells and today's date 0906-2022. And it's a good idea to do this. You can do some things based off of the selected features from before, but it's easy to lose them. So may as well just export it to a new layer. Doesn't take up that much room on your hard drive. So now we have the new layer and I'm gonna deselect the old layer and you can see what we have. Let's add a base map here. Let's look at the light gray canvas. So we can see some context with Lake Erie and the state boundaries and things like that. Another thing I'm going to do before I do the analysis is go into the map and go to properties. And I'm going to go to coordinate system. Now, I do a lot of work in Pennsylvania, so I have the Albers DEP saved here. The Department of Environmental Protection uses this in a lot of their data sets. And Albers is an equal area and data set that would be appropriate for this kind of analysis. Um, and in fact, I think that ArcGIS Pro will calculate this correctly if you skip this step, but I think it's best practice to just go ahead and do it. So we'll be looking at this in a equal area projection. And you can see that the map has changed a little bit. There's a little bit of a curve to the line, uh, to the latitude lines. All right. So we're going to do a two mile buffer zone here. So we're going to go to analysis and go to tools. I'm sorry, not two miles, two, two kilometers. And we're going to click on buffer. We're going to use our new layer here, unconventional drilled wells. And we're just going to rename this last part 2km and then underscore buffer. So linear unit. Um, the unit we want is two and kilometers. You have a choice here between planar and geodesic. It's not going to matter that much at these scales. I'm just going to leave it at its um, default and dissolve type. So I'm going to dissolve all output to a single feature. That way we don't have a whole bunch of overlapping circles. All right, let's run that and see what it looks like. Okay, the calculation is completed and here's what it looks like. I'm gonna get rid of the wells layer and you can see the buffer zone. This is the two kilometer buffer around the wells. So I'm gonna change what this looks like a little bit. Just get rid of the outline color And I'm adding the wells back in, which covers it up. I just want to see what this looks like when we when we zoom in on the area. So you can see here's each well, and there's a two kilometer buffer around them. And when there's a bunch of wells, 
Um, it's just this amorphous shape instead of a bunch of overlapping circles. All right, so that is the well part of this. Uh, now we have to find the uh, census data. All right, now we're going to look at the census data, which is the other main component of this analysis. So the census data came out in 2021, I think the data was released, and it's this decennial census PL 94-171, PL stands for public law, uh, redistricting data. And of course the census is conducted and the main purpose that the reason is conducted is to calculate uh, the legislative districts, uh, particularly congressional districts. Um, the census data that we have is one of several products that will be available. Uh, so this is recorded in 2022, and there'll be a, a few other products available in the next year or so. And some of those will have more details uh, with regard to the population in the census blocks. But this one is has a lot of detail on race data, and it has very limited data on age. So all it tells us is voting age population, 18 years of age and older. That's the only age variable in this data set. And this is the only data set that's currently available with demographic data at the census block level. So this will be okay for our purposes. We're looking for the population that is under the age of 18. So we're gonna take the total population and subtract the voting age population. So let's take a look at this. You can go to this site, and we'll leave these links in the uh, comments or in the, in the uh, discussion below. Uh, this is where you get the census data. So it comes in a geodatabase format. It's a monstrous file. It's 5.8 gigabytes, census blocks national geodatabase. If you want, you can look for a specific state. Uh, when I downloaded this, I downloaded the entire country. Um, you can also go to the FTP site if you prefer, just clicking on the link directly and it will download the geodatabase in a zip format. When you get that, uh, you'll have to know what you're looking at. Um, and there's a couple of references that are useful here. So one, the census released this redistricting data uh, PDF file. And this is pretty in-depth here. You can see it's 247 pages, and it, it talks about what we're looking at and what all the variables mean, um, why they're laid out the way they are. Another resource that they have is this file here, which is uh, the 2020 PL summary file field names. And what this has is when you when you open the data there are a number of different headers and they're all encoded because there's so much data here and they're broken up into a number of different groups so there's the geo header which has the location data and we'll need some of this there's the segment one definitions which has some basic population data and this has one of the fields we need which is the total population uh, this also has a number of uh, race columns. Um, we're not going to get into that right now, uh, but it does have um, a number of different categories for understanding the race of specific areas. Um, then the next group, this is this is just what it looks like as field headers. The next group of uh, of data is this segment two definitions and we need this field here as well so this is total but it's the total for all races population 18 years and older so this will give us the 18 and over population which we can then subtract from the total population so that's what we're going to be doing in the next step Okay, now that we're familiar with the census data, we're gonna add it to our map and see where it intersects with the area of interest for us. So we're gonna go ahead and add this geodatabase. And it's gonna ask us block 10 or block 20. 
block 10 is for the 2010 census and block 20 is for the 2020 census which is what we're interested in we'll go ahead and select that one and it will take quite a while to load and in fact we're going to interrupt it from loading because we don't need it to draw for the entire United States. Let's take a look at the attribute table really quickly here. And we can see that there's over 8 million of these polygon shapes, so there's no need to load them all. What we want to do is narrow in on the ones for Pennsylvania and we're going to do that by looking at this GOID code. That'll be the way to narrow it down. To do that, we're going to do a query here, a select by attribute query. Um, we're going to do a new expression here for the block 20 input rows. And we have the GOID is the frame that we're looking to work with here. So GOID is equal to, we want to start with begins with, and we're going to use 42 because the FIPS code for Pennsylvania is 42. So all of the uh, census blocks in Pennsylvania will start with 42. So let's go ahead and hit run and see what happens. Okay, this process took a couple of minutes and you can see we have 336,985 out of the 8.1 or 8.2 million blocks are in Pennsylvania. That sounds about right. Just for fun, let's just see what it looks like on the map. Of course, that'll take a while to draw. But it does look like the blocks within Pennsylvania are highlighted appropriately, so that checks out. Um, and now we're going to export this. Go to data. Export features. We'll just store it in the same geo database for this project. And we'll just call it PA Census 2020 Blocks. Don't be surprised if even routine steps take a couple of minutes to process with data sets of this size. It could be argued that this was an unnecessary step uh, because I'm going to be winnowing it down even further. However, I think sometimes it's useful to. Uh, have meaningful resting points in your data process stream so that if there is an issue, let's say your uh, GIS software crashes, for example, you don't have to start all the way from scratch. So now we're going to go do another selection. And this time, instead of select by um, by attribute, we're going to select by location. And we're going to use the PA Census 2020 blocks, which we just created. And we're going to select the ones that intersect the unconventional drilled wells two kilometer buffer zone. And we'll run. Okay, this step has completed. Let's take a look at the data and make sure that it makes sense before we go much further. So we're going to open the attribute table for the Pennsylvania blocks and we'll get rid of this national one because we don't need it anymore and let's take a look at our map find the sweet spot here so I can drag that down it does look like the areas that are highlighted align with the areas where the wells are on the map but let's just see what this looks like when we zoom in You can see as we zoom in that the shape is irregular. The highlighted shape is irregular and it lines up with the uh, census blocks. I'm going to move the buffer zone up above that layer so that you can see even these areas where the census block um, just barely intersects the buffer zone, it does select it. So we're going to have to take this into account as we move forward so that we're not overestimating the 
impacted population by including all of the areas like this one here. Let's zoom in on this one. You can just see, zoom in even more. Why is this selected? You can see this tiny little sliver north of this highway is within this buffer zone, but almost all of this particular census block is outside of it. So we're going to only use that tiny, tiny fraction, and it will probably have an insignificant uh, contribution to the totals for our calculations, um, but we're going to use it. So we'll see that process shortly. Okay, now we're gonna take our selected blocks from our Pennsylvania file and export this data as features. And to be descriptive, we're gonna say PA unconventional drilled wells two kilometer buffer census blocks. And we'll see that that will reduce it to 31,063 census blocks out of the 336,985 in Pennsylvania. Okay, that has finished processing. So let's just take a look at what we have. Now we're gonna get rid of the Pennsylvania census block layer and only look at the ones in our selected area. And again, just make sure that it visually makes sense. And to help us out again, I'm gonna move the buffer zone to the top. And that does appear correct. It does appear like the census blocks in the areas where the buffer zone are, are included. So what we wanna do now is go and calculate the fraction of each, buff, each census block that we want to count within the buffer zone. So to do that, we're going to go to the attribute table. And we're going to add some data fields. Let's get rid of some of the clutter here. We're going to add three data fields. We're going to add original square miles. Uh, this map is in kilometers. We'll use square kilometers. You could use either as long as you're consistent. And we're going to turn that to a float. And add another layer, another uh, field. And this one is going to be clip square kilometers. We haven't clipped it yet, but we're going to. And that's also going to be a float. And we're going to add a third, which is ratio. Uh, doesn't like that ratio. Let's just add a C underscore ratio. You can see that I've done some similar calculations here in the past with square miles, um, but we're gonna start this process over for the purpose of this demonstration. If you aren't there already, you need to go to the fields frame up top here, and we're just gonna hit save so that our new, uh, new field headers are locked into place. They're all set as float. And now we can close this and look at our attribute table again. And you can see that we have our original square kilometers, our clip square kilometers, and our clip ratio, and that currently everything says null because we haven't done any calculations on these fields yet. So let's do that. I'm going to right click here and go to calculate geometry. And we want to calculate 
area. And the unit we're going to use is square kilometers. Let's click on the coordinate system. It should be using what we use for the map, which is our, in our favorites folder, which is this Albers DP, which we talked about a few minutes ago. And we'll run. Okay, we're going to take a look at this really tiny fragment that is just, what, a seven ten thousandths of seven hundred thousandths of a uh, square kilometer. Let's see what that looks like. Well, here's the tiny little wedge here. All right, let's see one of the big ones, make sure that that makes sense. This one is 70 square kilometers. And we can see that that seems to be one of the biggest ones in the vicinity. Let's take away some of this other clutter. And this certainly does seem to be one of the larger blocks, so that checks out too. So on a very crude level are uh, calculations that seem to make sense from the smallest to the largest. Okay, so now we're gonna go back and look at this uh, map pane here. And we're gonna clear any selections so we don't have any partial calculations. And what we're gonna do is we're going to clip the blocks that we just calculated to these buffer areas that we looked at before. And that will allow us to do these other calculations that we have set ourselves up for but haven't done yet. So we're going to find our toolbar and we'll just type clip in here. And it's in the analysis tools if you prefer to find it that way. And for the input features we're going to be using this layer here Pennsylvania unconventional drilled wells, two kilometer buffer census blocks. And for the clip layer, we're going to use unconventional drilled wells, uh, two kilometer buffer. And we're going to just rename this from census blocks one to census blocks We'll run and we'll see what our results look like so here's our new clip layer it's the same color as these other ones so we'll have to deselect this and they seem to be circular in shape which is encouraging so let's just put the buffer zone on top of it and they do match up you can see with the transparency on the blue you can still see those lines of the census blocks beneath. So that's great. So we're going to close out of this so we're not confused. Just take a second here. Now we're going to open up the attribute table for the uh, census block clip that we just made. And we can do the rest of our calculations. So we have the original square kilometers. Now we have the clip zones. And we're going to calculate geometry. And we're going to, the property we're looking for is area. Area unit will be square kilometers. 
coordinate system. We'll again make sure that it's in the same one, the Albers DEP. And we'll run. All right, now we have our original square kilometer calculation as well as our clip square kilometer calculation. The clip square, square kilometer should in every case be equal to or less than the original square kilometer. It can't grow because we're cutting parts off, right? So um, we're gonna calculate our ratio now. And this time we're gonna go into calculate field instead of calculate geometry. So we're gonna do this in Python here, which is the default. Um, it's really not something to stress over too much, but all we're gonna do is take a very simple ratio here. And this is gonna start with our clipped square kilometers in the numerator divided by the original square kilometers in the denominator. So at most, our result should equal one. Sometimes there's rounding errors that are very slight, but let's see what happens. So we see a bunch of these are one, and that would indicate that the entire census block is within the clipped area, within the buffer zone. Um, let's make sure that that's the largest value, that there's no obvious errors. So we have a few of them that are zero, and these are for very, very small fractions and these will not meaningfully contribute to our population analysis, but there's no reason to get rid of them either. Uh, so this is the minimum value. Let's take a look at the maximum value by double clicking here again. And as expected, the maximum value is one. So there's quite a few of them. It does make sense that there would be uh, plenty of census blocks that were entirely within the zone. Let's just look at one in particular at random. And yes, you can see that this entire census block is within the zone, so it has a um, clip ratio of one. Okay, now we're going to have to shift gears a little bit and go into the other census data. And we're going to be looking for things that match this GOID, which is a 15 digit string of numbers. And so we're gonna save this here. First, we're going to go to the map and deselect everything. And project, save. And we'll come back to this in just a minute. Okay, now we need to obtain that demographic data from this PL94-171 census file. Here it is on my computer. There are some instructions from the Census Bureau on how to do this. Uh, they're pretty straightforward and accurate. Uh, there's also some videos that the Census Bureau has put onto YouTube that we'll put links in the description for, and those are worth checking out as well. Okay, let's take a look at the census data here. As you can see, there are a number of tables and then there are some queries. And these queries are based on uh, a number of different options that are available. Let's look at these uh, geo headers. Let's just double click on this table. And here you can see all of those field headers that we saw in that, in that spreadsheet before. And many of them have data in every field. Some of them have data in some fields. Um, you can also look at this GOID. You can see that some of them are longer than others. And we're going to be wanting only the ones that are 15 digits long. I'm sorry, there's, there's actually two different things here in this particular um, census file. There's a geocode and there's a GOID. The GOID is what we want on the uh, Geo database that we looked at before, but on this file we're going to be using the geocode, and we want those that are uh, 15 digits long. This first one is two digits, 
and that's 42, which is the state of Pennsylvania. And then these next ones are county level. Uh, 42 is the state, and 001 is the first county. 003 is the second county. This one's Allegheny County, for example. And when you start scrolling further and further down, you see that there's longer codes, and we'll need them that are 15 digits long, as I said before. So let's look at some of these other tables that are available to us. This is segment one, and this is where the demographic data begins. As you can see, there's quite a few different selections. There's a lot of different ways that this is sliced up. And segment two, and this all matches exactly what was in that um, spreadsheet that we looked at before. And segment three. And then there's a number of queries. So if you wanted to look at the queries for blocks, double click on this, and we're going to right click and look at this in the SQL form. And even if you're not super familiar with SQL, uh, it's just a way of accessing the data in a structured way from your database. And this particular grouping here will take the data for um, census blocks. And basically what we've done here is modified this. This is from a previous project here. Let's look at this. We've basically modified the census blocks a query to look at census blocks, but also with a certain subset of um, demographic data. So this is from a previous project, and we're going to modify this modification. This is a little difficult to read, so we're going to put this into another program here called Notepad++. And make sure that we have this properly copied. Okay, so here's our statement here. So we're selecting from the 2020 PL Geo header. As you can see, there's there's four different things here to select from. So from the PL Geo header, we're selecting uh, these attributes here: some love. Uh, geocode, geoid, geoheader. We're going to leave all of these geoheader selections the same as they are. Here, this was our selection for the uh, threat maps project. And in this particular case, we're not going to need as many of these um, demographic totals as before. But these all meet up, these all match up with the data in these tables here. So P0010001. I happen to know that that means total population. But if you go here, here's P0010001. So this would be the field that you'd be drawing from. So let's go back to our. Our look here. So we have, we know that we need P001001, and we'll figure out what the other codes are that we need. So here's that spreadsheet. And you can see I've highlighted a few fields. So the only demographic totals that we're looking for are P001001, and there's another one over here that I've highlighted, P003001. And so that first one will be the total population, 
and then the second one will be the population 18 years and older. Of course, we're looking for under 18 years, and we'll calculate that once we have this data, but this is what's available to us. So P001001 and P003001. So now let's make changes to the SQL view. And all that we're going to do is delete the parts that we don't want, because I think everything is here already that we do want. So we're going to delete 001003, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09. All of that is racial data, which is important but not part of this particular analysis. Um, it also had us look at P002002, 0002, um, which is an indicator for a Hispanic or Latino population, which is an independent variable from race. Um, we don't want that in this particular analysis. Uh, but we do want 0030001. Okay, um, let's run with that and see how well that works. So we're just going to copy this here and paste it here and right click, save. We have an issue to fix. Is it just an extra space? OK, let's see what the data sheet view looks like. Great, now we have the two codes that we want, the two uh, total population and the population 18 years and over. So now what we're going to do is export this. And we'll export it as uh, an Excel file or a text file. Um, we'll need to export it as a text file because we're going to be adding it to ArcGIS, which is has plugins to work with Excel, but it's much easier if we do it as a CSV. All right, so then you navigate to where you want to go. You give it the file name that you want to call it. You can see our option here is text file because that's what we had selected before. But we can make it a comma separated value file by just typing .csv at the end. OK, we have exported the data here, and it opens. Uh, the, there's a slight issue here, which is that there are no field headers in this. It gets right into the right into the data. Other than that, it seems like the data is all here and in good shape. Uh, but let's make sure that we have the field headers. All right, and this is where we went wrong before. We failed to click this box, include field names on first row. So let's go ahead and do that. It's comma delimited. The text qualifier is the quote. So these quotes should go away. All right, now we're done with the access part, and we're just going to do this in Excel. And this is what we have to work with. And I'm just going to go ahead and take a good look at our data here. So we have a number of different fields. We're going to be using this geocode field to match with, uh, which means we don't need this geoid code. This has other characters. You can see that there's, if you look at these numbers closely, there's a lot of similarities between the two. But this one has some letters in it. It has this US 42, and that's where the number starts. Um, we just need the number to match. We don't need all this stuff 
in front of it. Um, we don't need this name of block 1000, block 1001. Um, we don't need the space name, and we don't need this 750 column here in the beginning. So we're just going to go ahead and get rid of all of those things. Keep the fields that we want. And we're going to make life easier for ourselves and rename the fields that we do want. So this is the total population. I'm just going to call it TPOP. And this is the over 18 population. Um, one thing I've noticed is that it's often difficult when you're using a CSV, we're going to be importing this into ArcGIS. Uh, frequently, it doesn't work very well if you start your field headers with a number. So I try not to do that. Um, and also, you have to keep it rather short or it will be truncated. and if you have things like spaces in it, it will probably um, convert those to underscores. So I just like to keep it as short as possible and, and descriptive as possible at the same time. So this is the over 18 population. So um, it's really 18 plus, um, but we're going to have a new field here and we're just gonna call it U18 for under 18, right? And to get that figure, we're just going to do a simple equation here, which is equals, we're gonna click on B2 and then minus C2. And that gives us the result. If there's nine people 18 and older, that means there's only two people who are under 18 in this particular census block, right? But we want this to apply to all the blocks. So we'll just double click and we'll fill it out. And then another step to do, you can see that up here, there is a formula in the cell. And so I think it's uh, advantageous or required. Let me hit undo because it's trying to. All right. Um, I think it's advantageous or required to change all of these two numerical values instead of these formulas. So we're just going to hit copy, go back up to the top, and then right click, and we'll paste it as values. And now when we click on these, we see there's numbers up top instead of formulas. So that's what we're looking for. All right, that's all we need for this. Um, so we're going to go ahead and save this. And we'll make sure that we know where it's located. And we'll add it to uh, ArcGIS Pro in just a moment. Okay, this is where our files are. The first two were mess ups, so it's the version three that we're after. I'll go ahead and click on that. And you'll see it's added down here as a standalone table. So if we open this up, let's do it the right way. We'll right click and open. You can see these same fields that we saw in Excel. We have the geocode, which is a numerical value. Um, we have total population 18 and over and under 18. So what we're going to do is go back to our clipped census block and we're going to perform a join. Joins and relates, we're going to add a join. We're going to be, on this file, we're going to be using this GeoID code. And on this file, we're going to be using GeoCode. And you can see that this isn't a different numerical format right now. Let's see if it works correctly. And it says that the join is completed, so we're going to go back to this and see if the data has been attached. And indeed, no, there's an issue because of the way the numerical values were presented. These fields all came up as null. So let's try that over. 
Okay, so here's what I've done. I've removed the join. I removed the CSV file from ArcGIS Pro. Uh, I saved, I closed the ArcGIS Pro document, and I went back into uh, Excel and reconverted it to a numeric field the way I showed the first time and saved it. Let's see if that worked. We're gonna add that back in, go to map, and then add data. And here's the one that we're looking for. And let's take a look at this. And unfortunately, this has been converted back to this format here. So it looks like this won't match. This is a uh, new version of Excel that I have, and apparently it's doing this automatically. So do some more troubleshooting and come back. This is probably a good time to reflect on the fact that looking for workarounds from software issues is a big part of the overall task. In this case, some documentation I've seen suggested saving it as a text document instead of a comma separated value file. And then we're going to rename it now. We're gonna go into properties. And we're just gonna add a .csv to the end of the file name here. Okay, we're back in Excel, and you can see that the formatting has gone back to this exponential format. And so we're gonna have to look for a workaround here to make these two products be compatible with each other. So I'm gonna highlight uh, column A, go hit Control-1. Let's get rid of these things. Control-1. And we're going to go to number, take decimals back down to zero. We've done this a few times now. And we're going to make a new column here. And I'm going to call it geocode text. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a formula equals PA then hyphen and then I'll close the quotes, and then I'll hit the ampersand and click on A2. And what this is going to do is make a text field, which uh, Excel will not reformat, and therefore we'll match this in the, in the data that we're trying to match it to, so that they're both starting with this PA. I'm, you know, I'm using that for Pennsylvania. Um, and anyway, we'll give this a try. We'll click down. And these all have formulas in them, so we're going to change those all to values. So just hit Control Shift down, highlight them all, Control C to copy, and then hit the up arrow to go to the top, right click, and we're gonna paste as values right on top of the existing data. So now when you click on them up here, you'll see this text value instead of the formulas. So let's go ahead and save that. And we're actually up to version five, trying to find our workarounds here. And it's just in CSV format, so we'll go ahead and save. Close that. Now we're going to go back into ArcGIS and we're going to get rid of this file because we're no longer going to use version 3. We're going to add a field here. And we're going to call it GeoID text. And so we're going to convert the type from long, which is a numeric field, to text. And then we're going to go into our table here. We'll go into our fields tab and hit save. And 
and this should take just a moment. Okay. So now let's look at our attribute table again. And we should have a field here at the end called GeoID text. Now, of course, they're all null because we haven't told ArcGIS Pro what to put in here yet. So let's right click on the field and we're going to calculate the field. And when this tool comes up, we'll put in a formula that mimics what we did before. Okay, so here we are in uh, Calculate Field. We're doing this in Python 3. And so we have PA underscore, or PA hyphen in quotes, and then the plus sign, and then we clicked on the GeoID field. So that, that should bring in the GeoID value, value into each of these cells. So let's see if this works after a couple tries. And there we have it. So PA hyphen and then the GeoID number. So this one starts with 42 and ends in 2001. And let's just make sure that this is formatted, formatted the same way here. Starts with 42, ends in 2001. So it looks like these are formulated correctly. Now we're going to go ahead and add our new version of the CSV file in. So we're going to go back to map, add data. And we're going to refresh this because we've added some stuff here. We're going to add version 5. Let's just get rid of version 3 because we don't need that any longer. So this is the, this is the layer we're working with here. So we're going to go to Joins and Relates, which is here somewhere. Joins and Relates. And we're going to add a join. So in our shape file here, or our geodatabase, uh, we're gonna look at this GeoID text, right? That's that field that we've just made, GeoID text. And in our join table, we're gonna use geocode text. And if we wanna look at that, just to make sure that that's correct, here's our geocode text. You can see once again the geocode was transformed back to the exponential format. That won't work for us. But hopefully our workaround will. So let's hit the run button and we'll see what happens. So the join is already complete. We're going to go back to that attribute table. seems to not have let's click out of the attribute table and go back into it and see if it loads properly this time all right so let's scroll over and see if we have the data that we're looking for so here's the geo ID text Here's that geocode in that weird format. And now we have our new data that we're looking for, our total population, the 18 and over population, and the under 18 population. And we'll just check again, make sure that these things make sense. So 82 plus nine should equal 91 to get to total population, and it does. 19 plus three should equal 22, and it does. 16 plus 11 should equal 27, and so forth. So our spot checking here shows that this seems to have processed in a way that makes sense. And we'll do further tests uh, once we continue to process the data to make sure that it looks appropriate. So we have this. We're going to export this um, because it's held together with a join right now. and joins are easy to undo. So we want to keep this in case our, our program crashes. We'll always be able to go back to it if we save it as a new layer. OK, our new layer has finished processing. Took a surprisingly long time to 
uh, run. But let's look at our attribute table here. Make sure that it's what we think it should be. And it has, once again, it has the uh, the um, contents for each block, total population, 18 and over, under 18. Those are really the ones that we were interested in. It's added a few extra fields because that's what the program does. So now we're going to add to it. Um, we're going to get rid of this other layer just to prevent confusion. And we're going to go add some fields. Because once again, what we're interested in is not the population for each block. So if we bring up this original blocks file, let's give it a different color. Let's we'll give it something distinctive like this. We don't want to know what the entire block population was. We only want to know what the population is within the clipped areas, right? So for this block here, you can see it extends well beyond the boundary of this purple clip zone. So now we've added the demographic data to it. We're going to add a few fields. We're going to add clip pop. We're going to add clip T pop. And we're going to make that a float, which will allow for decimals. And we're going to add clip U18. And once again, we're going to make that a float. It looks like this one went back to long. So make that a float. And we're going to save our new fields. All right, now we're looking back at the attribute table here. I'm going to scroll over. And here's our new fields that we just added. Clip total population, clip 18 population, under 18 population. So these are going to be pretty easy to do. We're going to go to calculate field. And we're going to, for clip total population, we're going to take total population and simply multiply it by that ratio that we calculated before. And that was the ratio of the clipped area to the total area of each census block. And then we'll re repeat the same process for the under 18 population. And so we have some zeros. Let's see if that makes sense. Well, zero times anything is going to give you zero. So of course, that makes sense. And these have, this has a total population of seven. And now this clipped fragment has 2.174 uh, people in it. And of course, we don't want to talk about people as decimals, but that's how we're doing this calcul calculation for this part of the uh, procedure. So let's do the same thing for the under 18 population. You can just change the field here to clip U18. And instead of T pop, get rid of that and just use the under 18 population. So U18 times that same ratio should give us our new results. All right, so our basic calculations are complete for the total population and the under 18 population. However, these are populations for census blocks, or rather fragments of census blocks. And you can see there's 31,000 of them in our data set here. And let's just zoom out and we'll see how many of these little tiny pieces there are. Um, this is not going to be particularly useful for anybody, so what we're going to do is aggregate them by county. And we can use this geo code or the, we can use the well either the original geocode or the geocode text to aggregate them by county. Since 
census blocks are discrete within one county, we can do this. Um, if it were not that way, like with uh, if you're aggregating to zip codes, for example, it would be a different procedure. But in this GOID, the first two steps, the first two digits, 42, as we discussed earlier, are the state code. And then the next three are the county code. So 42003, that happens to be Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. And um, you can see that there's quite a few different fragments that start with that code in, in the Allegheny County area. And then if we scroll all the way down, we'll see other, other counties here, 42131, and so on. But how are we going to aggregate them by county? Well, we're going to go back and make a new field. So we'll click over here again and click here to add a new field. We'll call it county code. It's going to be, well, we could do it numeric. So we'll leave it as long and go to fields, save. Okay, and all we want to do is grab the left five digits of this GOID field. We could have used one of these other ones that we would have created. It has the PA in front. Uh, then we would have had to have done it as text. And we would have to include these extra three digits, the PA and then the hyphen and 42131. But in this case, we don't need to do that. We're going to calculate field. And you can see it is not the correct field that we're trying to calculate here. County code is not showing up. Let's, let's click out of this and try it again. Calculate field. There we go. County code is right there. All right, so now all we need to do is find the left function. And just scroll and see. I think it's I think I can find this in arcade easier. And within the parentheses here, we're just going to double click on GOID and then after this we're going to we want the first five digits so we're going to put a comma and then five I think that's the correct formatting here let's try it out okay we got an error here and our error code failed to input on OID 31064 and you can see this last row here has nulls Seems to have nulls all the way across. I don't know what this row is. Um, yeah, I'm going to actually delete this because there seems to be no data here from any of our three sources. So this seems to be a weird artifact. So we're going to delete that row. And now we're going to go back over to the end here and see if that was our only error. We're going to put them in order here. They're probably already in order. But just to make sure, we're going to start at the very top. And start so off with 42003. And it goes down to 42131. And there don't seem to be any more null values. So that's good. I think we're OK with that surprise error. And now we want to dissolve uh, by these county boundaries. So we're going to go into Analysis and to Tools. And we're going to just type dissolve here. 
And the input features that we're using is this demo join. And it's going to make a new feature class, which it'll call demo join dissolve. And then the dissolve fields that we're going to use are the county code. So it will dissolve everything by this county code. So we're going to add a few numeric values to this because while we want it to dissolve to the county, we also want to have uh, some of this data that we've added along the way as well. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to add in the original square kilometer of each block. We're going to add in the clipped square kilometer of each block, and it's going to add all of these together by those county codes. And if we wanted to change that, we could, but sum is what we're looking for. So we want the total population of those blocks and we want the under 18 population of those blocks and then we want those clipped values as well. So clip total population and clip under 18. These are the values that we're really looking for in this project. The other ones are going to give us some context. So we'll run this and take a look at our results. Okay, the calculations are complete. So remember with the blocks we started with 31,000. Here you can see there's far fewer uh, lines if we switch between, there's all of these divisions here, and now there's only a handful. So let's look at the attribute table here. And we can see that there are now 40 different uh, counties in, in this analysis here. And that sounds about right. Uh, and here we have the clip pop totals here. So this county, which is Allegheny County, where the city of Pittsburgh is, you can see there's not drilling in the city itself. Uh, there are still, however, 22,000 people within two kilometers of uh, drilled unconventional oil and gas wells in Allegheny County. And 4,279 of those people, if we're rounding up, are under 18. And you can see we also have the population for all of the other counties in the analysis as well. So we're going to take this, and this is, this is what we were looking for, but we're going to do one final thing, and that is we're going to convert these to round numbers because, of course, people are not decimals, they're people. Um, so we want to count people as, as whole numbers. Uh, if we had done this earlier in the stage, it could have introduced a significant amount of error um, for reasons that are a little bit complicated to explain. But essentially, um, we, ha we have to always keep in mind that this is a model. And when we do the rounding at the very end, that's the least amount of change that we're doing to our calculation. So um, when we had Let's bring the other layer back up. When we had all these tiny little fragments of census blocks that we were counting, if we rounded that at that early stage, then this could well be zero people. We'll click on it and see what the results are here. You can see that the um, clipped population for that tiny fragment would be two people, 1.92, and then the clipped under 18 population would be 0 0.58. So this would have rounded up to one, so it would have overestimated here, and this would round up to two, 
which is fairly close, but the way that we're doing this by rounding at the very end will reduce the amount of error caused by the rounding process, at least in my estimation. So we're doing it at the end. And so once again, we're going to add two new fields. Before we do that, we're going to make sure that we don't have anything selected. And demo join dissolve. So right, we want to add fields to this. So in this case, it's not allowing us to add any fields to this layer. Then the other most likely reason that we can't add a new field here is that something is being edited. So we're going to click on edit up here and just hit save, save all edits. This might be from when we deleted that uh, one record before. So now that everything is saved, so we've saved up above, but we still see this here, no pending edits. And now we are finally able to add fields to this. So we're going to put clip pop as a long. Again, up above we had these as uh, floats, which is, I guess it was converted to doubles. Either way, they're decimals. Um, now we're going to have them as longs. Um, which will give us integers. So, fields, save. go back here okay we see our two new fields and we're going to do some quick calculations here calculate field clip pop we're going to use this previous one that we had called clip u18 and then it was added together as a sum when we dissolve by counties so we're just going to double click here Oops, sorry, this is the wrong one. We're going to double click on this first one. The total population. And that's complete. Does that make sense? We have Allegheny County 22,701. And the previous figure was 22,000. Oh, 22,071. So that did round appropriately. Here we have 30,036. And this was 30,035.64. So that rounded appropriately as well. And we'll just replicate that for this last field. And we'll use that under 18 population. And once again, we'll just look and make sure that these make sense. So we have 4,279 as opposed to 4,278.756 people. 5,472 versus 5,472.064. So these have rounded appropriately. These are our estimated populations for the total number of people affected in the uh, two kilometer radius of drilled unconventional wells in Pennsylvania. And this is that same calculation for the under 18 population. And I've opened this data up in Excel and it's a little easier in this format to just take a look at how much of a difference this made. So we can see that 
this field here is the sum of the blocks within a given county. And we can see that the blocks in this particular county, which is Bradford County, added up to 45,192 people, the, the number of people who lived in those blocks. And when we did our calculation based on the fraction of the blocks with our two kilometer buffer zone, that's brought the population down to 41,428. So almost 4,000 fewer people, which makes sense because we're cutting parts of these census blocks off to get a better estimate. So in this county here, which is um, Butler, we've gone from 102,932 people in those census blocks down to 83,418 people within our two mile buffer zone. So you can see that it really does have a significant impact on the calculations which we think uh, yield better results.